Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you. Ramon, we're glad you're up, but you behave and take care of yourself. Okay. <laughs> My name is Pasha, and I am from St. Louis, Missouri. And um, this is all very new to me. So if I make a big mistake, just let it go. It's all right. Um, Suji and I are going to be sharing this uh, satsang time. So the um, the satsang that we chose is um, choosing and no, no, I'm completely I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm nervous. Um, it's it's um, being chosen, not choosing. So Guru Raj in this one, there's an introduction, which is quite nice. When you look, there's a brief description of the satsang. And so Suji and I decided we would read that description to you before we begin the actual video. And um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this to you. This is uh, US 85043. And it was actually in November of 1985. And in watching this, I'm pretty sure this was the first morning of a course that we were on. And it was my first course with Guru Raj. So um, that's, what, that's what this tape is, this video is. So the, the description is, in the largest sense, there is nothing but divine will. Yet we try to narrow the vastness of divine will by thinking we are the doer. We could do nothing without the divine energy empowering us. Divinity is just an energy. It has no will. But manifestation is the expression of that energy and our existence is manifestation. For manifestation is the re relativity of life. When we say, thy will be done, we ask that we not fragment with our little wills the totality of manifestation, that it cooperate with us so that we can gather the pieces and merge into manifestation itself. That mergence, is the first step to become one with the energy. We go from our ego will to divine will to merging away into that infinite energy. But divine will is not infinite. It is limited to the structure of the universe while the impersonal God is beyond the universe and yet penetrates every atom in the universe. Divine will is motion but underlying it is the stillness that we must become. So our ego makes choices based on discrimination, and that is the preconditioning of our thought, of our thought forms. Divine will does not make choices for us, but find the area of choiceless, choiceless choice where you just flow and the right path is shown. You are chosen to do something by that divine will and you flow with it. You become, I'm sorry, <laughs> my eyes are going wacky. You become the, the star, oh, you become the star playing a part. Yet the director is there to direct you, that impersonal God. Thy will must be empowered by that energy. It is the energy that energizes the divine will which constitutes this universe. So we become harmonious with the universe. We don't have to choose. Choice involves the mind. Be chosen. Be yourself and live in compliance with nature. For nature constitutes the entire universe. Flow with the current and learn the lessons of life. For choice is also related to awareness. 
For the dominant thought in one's mind should be, I am not the doer, he chooses, I am only the chosen. So that's the kind of synopsis of uh, the satsang. So we can go ahead and play. It's about 20 minutes of the tape that we're going to listen to. Beloved Guruji, what is the influence of divine will in our choice and performance of occupations? In the larger sense, there's nothing else that exists but divine will. Now, man's tendency is this, to narrow down the vastness of divine will to their own will, which consists of nothing else but the egos. So the ego says, I do this, and I do that, and yet, the ego does nothing at all. Hmm? For how could the ego function at all hmm? without that energizing force that is there of divine will? Now, the divine will is a misnomer, it's a fallacy. The divinity has no will at all. Hmm? Divinity is an energy. But where the will comes in is in manifestation. For that energy, as every kind of energy, has to express itself in some way or the other. Hmm? And that energy expresses itself in manifestation. This manifestation in turn is what has created you. And your very existence, your very creation is nothing else but manifestation. Now, what is manifestation? Hmm? Manifestation is the relativity of life. Hmm? From its grossest level to its highest level, yet it still remains manifestation, which is empowered by that energy. Now, this manifestation is called divine will. Hmm? When we say, thy will be done, what does it really mean? Hmm? That may the totality of manifestation cooperate with me. Let me not by my little self fragment it or cut it into pieces. Hmm? So, we try to gather the pieces that we have cut up hmm? into the totality of manifestation so that we could merge into manifestation itself. Hmm? the totality of manifestation. Now this mergence is the first step that would take place for you to become one with the energy. Manifestation are like waves on the ocean, hmm? up and down and up 
and down and up and down. But yet, what creates those waves? That is the question. The creation of those waves are because of the energy currents that flow deeper down in the ocean. And that is the energy man has to reach to become divinity itself and not the will. Hmm? So, here's a process of elimination all the time. Hmm? Where you go from your personal egofied will hmm? to di divine will and then you merge away into that infinite energy. Because divine Miles per minute. Hmm? And you take the example of light. 186,000 hmm? miles a second. It's moving. Everything is moving. You think you're sitting still there? No, you're moving. Hmm? For every cell in your body is in motion. Otherwise you would not be sitting here. Otherwise you would not be existing. You will uh, disintegrate. So, divine will consists of motion. Right. But now, underlying this motion, there is the stillness where man has to reach and will reach in time to come. Hmm? And reaching that stillness, you will become part of the motion that controls this entire universe and still be apart from it. Hmm? You become the observer of the motion. And in that observation you find that stillness and yet you're involved in the motion of divine will. Hmm? So, when it comes to choices, who chooses for you? Your ego chooses. Because the ego is patterned, and according to its patterning, it makes its choice. Hmm? You are fond of mountains, or someone is fond of the sea. Why? Hmm? Because you are used to mountains. Hmm? So you are attracted to the mountains. And if you are fond of the sea, you are attracted to the sea. Hmm? But yet, Man can combine within himself the mountains and the sea together. Hmm? For what is the difference between the mountain and the sea? Hmm? You will have just as much ozone hmm, up in the hills, the mountains, as you would have at the seaside. Hmm? What is the difference between the molecular structure between the mountain and the sea? None whatsoever. And then, where did the mountain come from? 
It was an eruption in the sea that pushed up the mountain. Hmm? And if you climb mountains, you are sure to find, as in my younger days, I used to love mountaineering. Hmm? And on the mountains I used to find sea shoals. Hmm? So, did the mountain not rise from the sea itself? So why do I discriminate between the mountain and the sea? Hmm? Now, if I could bring myself to find the oneness of everything, the mountain and the sea, hmm? and the land that's in between it, then I am in compliance with divine will. So choices are made because of your preferences and your preferences are governed hmm, by preconditioning. That's why you choose the mountain or you choose the sea. Yes, see. So, choices are made because of your ego self Mm. And your ego self is nothing else but thought formation. Mm. So, the process is simple, really. You unform the formation. Mm. And then, when you can do that, you will learn to look observe yourself and the various processes of the mind that leads you to certain kinds of choices. Hmm? So you have a vacation hmm? for two weeks. Now, are you going to go to New York or Los Angeles? Why? How does that choice come about? Hmm? Because you might have read up some articles on New York. Hmm? So you're attracted to New York. Hmm? You want to go and see the Empire State Building. Hmm? Or else, you might have read articles on California, the 17-mile drive. Hmm? So therefore, you're attracted to that. So choice is a matter of conditioning to repeat again. Hmm? Divine will does not choose for you. It is your own ego self that chooses hmm? and the ego self, as I said before, is nothing but a whole conglomeration of thought forms created by yourself, by your environment, by your childhood, by past lives, perhaps. Who knows? Yes, see. Ah, but the greatest area to discover is to have choiceless choice. Now, what does that mean? Choiceless choice. Hmm? Where you do not choose anything, hmm? but you flow into everything. Hmm? And then in that flow, the right path is shown to you. If you should go to New York or to Los Angeles. What do you say? Hmm? Mind you, Los Angeles is quite nice. I like Disneyland. <laughs> Uh, 
I don't like New York. You can't at night walk through Times Square or through Central Park without getting mugged. Yes, then. So, it is not a matter of choosing. It is a matter of being chosen. This is the difference. Hmm? You are chosen to do a certain thing by the divine will. Hmm? And you just flow with it. Why not? Hmm? I might have used this analogy before somewhere in some country, I don't know. Hmm? You sit at the ocean side and you watch all those waves up and down and up and down. Hmm? But you can enjoy those waves if you become a surfer hmm? and surf along on the waves. Hmm? So then it becomes a sport, it becomes a play. And is life not a play? Hmm? Actors on the stage, uh, acting away, playing their parts. And yet the actor realizes that if he should play a Romeo hmm, or whatever, Hamlet, is that the other, hmm, he's not that Romeo and he's not Hamlet. Hmm? And it's not Julius Caesar either. Right. He's playing a part. Hmm? So if life could be regarded as just playing a part and to flow with the part, hmm? for the directors there to direct you, hmm? that energy that impersonal God, if you would like to use that kind of terminology, <coughs> hmm? is directing you all the time. Hmm? So it is the energy which is the empowering force and not divine will. To repeat again, it's a fallacy of all theologies, thy will be done. Hmm? Thy will is never done without it being empowered by this energy. It is the energy that energizes the divine will which constitutes this universe. But that was Sutria, and I really do think that was a, an early course for me. I, I, when I listened to this tape, the whole idea of choosing and being chosen and choosing, I have no idea how I got to here, except a whole series of events that kept pushing me in this direction. And um, growing up, I was um, I was born and bred Catholic. I still am. I still go to church every Sunday. Um, but I, I somehow found myself wanting something more, and I didn't know where to go. Through a whole series of events, and actually one of my former students, I was brought to Guruaj. And I don't know that there was any choosing in it. <laughs> I don't know that I even felt I had a choice. I just kind of showed up and he was there. Um, Meryl told me once a long time ago that this event that we had, 
there were about 150 maybe people at this event and um, he, he came to talk. And Meryl and Mataji told me years later that of all those people who came to hear him, I was the only person who signed up to take lessons and to go to the next talk. So I guess I was chosen to be there and to meet him. There was, uh, I don't know that I had a lot of choice. I just showed up and kept showing up. I think that's part of it is um, for us to be on the path where we're going, we gotta show up. You're all here this morning because we're supposed to be here. There's something that we're supposed to get. And um, being present to this, we will get it from what he had said. Something in what he said stuck with you. And that's what you were here for, was to get that little seed, that little kernel that you could plant and it will grow. So um, that's the first thing. And I was thinking this, and I've listened to this tape probably five or six times, especially like the first 20 minutes I listened to it. Um, that's my process because I can't remember anything. So I better do it over and over and over again until I get it. And um, this morning, I was listening to it and, and what came to me was the whole idea of divine will. Now, having grown up the way I did, divine will was like, that's the right and then there's the wrong and you better choose the right or you're gonna go to hell. You know, it's like, that's how I grew up. That was it. But I know that um, now I don't think that, but divine will, I was thinking this morning that there's, Divine will seems like something that's out there um, that comes into me, you know, like that. But what I was thinking this morning, I'll just read what I wrote. I wrote divine will out there, out there to me, or is divine will something that is from within? And when I recognized as being part of God, that divine will is already there. It's not something that's coming into me. It's something I'm discovering within myself. And if I am part of God, or if I am that lives within me, then I am divine will itself. But it is the recognition and then the manifestation of this truth in my being and my life. I have to realize that that I uh, that God lives within me. And once I've recognized that, the focus of my life and the way that things manifest around me takes on a whole different way of, of looking at things, a whole different experience of, of divinity. Um, I think that too, he talked about the mountain and the sea I think that um, think that once we realize that we are part of all this, that nothing I see, nothing I do is separate from the, the divine. I, I'm I'm in it. I'm I am it. That once we get this, there's a lessening of separation of things and people and life around us. We're not so separate anymore because we can't be separate if we're part of it all, if it all is us. So I was laughing this morning as I was doing that, I kept thinking, we are the world, we are the children. You know, that, that whole thing kept coming. I thought, oh, that's, that was a whole other way of looking at it. So it's, um, it's just, listen, I'm gonna put this aside. I keep looking at what I wrote. Um, that if I come to recognize that I am part of the divine, then I am part of the divine will. And the choices that I make are not right or wrong. They simply are choices. And I think that when we've done that, we then can relax in our lives. This might be something that comes with age. The older I get, the more I think I'm just relaxed in the fact that this is what I have. This is it. This is what I've got. And there's less 
craving and yearning for things. He used to say that it's not wanting to have the the 10, 12 room house. It's the yearning and the aching for it that is the problem. But if you just accept it, then you get it. Um, I have one other thing. Oh, it's like the choose, when Sutria asked about um, what do you, the choosing of a career. I think that oftentimes everything seems to me lately to be so set up. It's like things occur for a real natural reason that when I was a little girl and was going through school, um, I, I adored my teachers. I had wonderful teachers. And I never saw them as mean or anything. They were just teachers and they taught me so much that I really wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to emulate those, those people. And so when I got out of high school and I went to college, I wanted to be a teacher. Now, what I was going to teach was a choice. I liked English and I liked history and I liked um, music and I liked um, art. And in the end, I chose to go into art and I taught for 45 years. I've been retired about two years now, two and a half. And I taught and I am telling you every morning I would get up and I'd go and I loved it. I loved my kids. You know, the kids, I, the children I taught were wonderful. Some of them were little stinkers, but you learn to love the stinkers along with the kids who are, you know, easy to keep, teach. Sometimes I think the ones I still get Christmas cards from, the ones that occasionally will call me on a phone, they were the stinkers. They were the little ones who gave you the most trouble. So I think for Guru Raj, sometimes when I would watch him and I think, I don't know, I think you're, I don't know about you. You know, I was never quite sure of him. That's because he was a stinker. He was a little, you know, he caused trouble. <clears throat> There's a, a line from something written by an American artist. His name is Robert Henry. And it says something to the effect, I'm paraphrasing, but <clears throat> he says, when the artist is alive in you, you become daring, unexpected, uh, questioning things. All those things become alive. So the artist within you, it, it's the stinker. It's the little part of you that wants to challenge and wants to learn and wants to grow and wants to become more of yourself than you ever thought you could be. And that basically is what I've learned in the last few years is that um, I've become more of the person that I was supposed to be. And I think before this, I fought it. I fought being that person because I, you know, I just didn't think that she was worthy of anything. And now I know that I'm loved. I know that. And one of the reasons that I'm so happy in who I am is, is Guru Raj. He taught me to love myself. So I think one of the things we have to do is stick with it. You know, you don't get it right away, unfortunately. <laughs> you have to wait. And you have to grow and you have to practice. And I think that the practice of um, going within helps you to recognize more and more that you are, you have that divine energy within you, that divine will is within you. And once you get that, once you recognize it, and I don't mean that it comes, it's not with me 24 seven, but boy, when the moments come and you go, oh yeah, there it is. You know, you get these little glimpse, glimpse of, um, oh, I am a child of God. You know, <laughs> it's a really, it's really cool when it happens. And then you think, oh, I wish I could get that back. And then your mind's off in other places. But um, I think basically that's, that's what I wanted to say. I just, uh, I encourage you to stay on, you know, keep on the path and Keep doing things that help you to know that the choices are, are being given to you and nothing you make is wrong. It's just you get to decide which of the choices. And um, that's through your, your yourself and your own divine will.
I think that's it. So thank you. I think Sujay is up wherever he is. I can't find him. <laughs> I'm here. I think. Here, here. <laughs> yeah, I had a, I had a small internet glitch, and I had to reboot my router, and it was sort of touch and go there for a while. So, in case all of a sudden I'm lost, you'll know it was the internet went south. But um, anyway. Yeah, I uh, thank you, Pasha. That was really, uh, I always love when you speak. It just comes out so natural and effortless and, and just genuine. And that, that's really, that's really enjoyable. It's like a very calming, it's very calming. Anyway, <sighs> choosing and being chosen. I, I, I'm not sure how much I really have to say. Um, between Guru Raj and Pasha, I think they they kind of summarized it, you know, or expounded on it very well. And it's when we when we think of words like chosen and choosing, they're 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 just concepts. They're concepts that they're words that represent concepts that we have adopted inside our mental patterning. And that's really all they are. We, and, and the control implies direction, uh, a specific direction that is determined by some act of will, if you will. And, and that's really not so, that's not the way it works. It's not the way it works. The ego thinks it's in control, that it is the doer, one point of fact. It has no fundamental existence in and of itself. As Guru Raj said, the ego is nothing but a bundle of thought Sí, parece que hay problemas con su Jay, con internet. Tal vez pueda continuar Pasia. Pasia. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm sorry we lost him. He'll come back. He always shows up again. No matter what, he just shows up again. So, <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of some, there was something else that, um, oh, you know, I was thinking too about being in the presence of Guru Raj, um, how I think that when I was in the presence of him, I came away with more and more and more questions, more questions. And I didn't get any clarity about anything till maybe two months after I saw him. But in his presence, I was just always so confused. Like, I have no flipping idea what he's talking about. And um, he, now when I listen to him, when I listen to a, a, a tape or whatever, I tape, you can tell how old I am. I'm saying tape. Um, when I listen to that, a lot of times it's much quicker. I can get things much quicker now than I used to. Um, and I don't, I think that's the, the marvel that I always feel for people who have come through his tapes and through listening to things or reading things, that they arrive at this spot of, of knowingness and understanding. I don't know that I could have done it. I've said this before. I don't know that I could have done it without having a, a person, a live person to talk to or to listen to. 
I think you're all extremely brave and intelligent and bright to be able to do this. Um, I just think that yeah, it's amazing how we're all called. We're called from wherever we are to become part of all this. And um, it's such a gift. It's such an incredibly beautiful gift wrapped in a wonderful bow. And um, I just think that it's, if we can give it to anyone else, it's, it's such a, such a pleasure to be able to share this. Um, I was never a big teacher in the sense of having classes and teaching meditation. I just always liked being involved in it. And, um, but I would teach, I guess I taught, many of us teach in another way. You teach by your life, by your, by what you do with your life, by how you treat people. That's, that's the lesson. I can remember people coming into my classroom and um, they would just walk in and say, oh, it's so, it's so peaceful in here. This is such a quiet place. Ah, he's back. I told you he would return. <laughs> <laughs> For how take, long? Who knows? Take it away, Sujay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm simply an illusion. I'm a transient <laughs> illusion that comes and goes. Anyway... This whole idea of control, which is what choice and choosing is all about, isn't it? It's about control, direction. And the ego, because of its patterning, thinks it chooses. It, it doesn't. Firstly, it's predisposed. Okay, we now have a lovely image of Sujay. <laughs> oh, technology, don't you love it? Don't you love it? Uh, when it works, it's great. <laughs> so what are we learning from this? You know, um, I don't know. I, this threw me off. I'm off, I'm off, I don't know. Uh, I just, is he completely gone now? He's gone now. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of some instances of, you know, I, he was taught, he talks at some point, I don't know if we heard it or not. He talks about going to LA or going to New York at choice. He, oh, yes. And he says he doesn't like New York because you'll get mugged. You know, I'm, um, I'm somebody who loves the mountains. I love going to the mountains. I live in St. Louis, which is kind of in the middle of the country. And almost every summer for about the last at least 10 years, I've driven out to New Mexico, which is in the Southwest. And it's about, it's about 1200 miles, about 1200 miles from here to New Mexico. And I drive by myself through the mountains and through the prairie <laughs> all the way out to New Mexico. And um, I, I love the solitude of it. You know, I, and some people are like, are you kidding? You drive all that way. Aren't you afraid? I don't know. I must be stupid. I'm not afraid. I just go. And I, I always feel like I'm not alone. You know, that, um, I think Guru Raj watches over us. I don't know. Maybe that's a Catholic thing thinking the dead watch over us, but I, I do. I believe that there's times when I'm going to do something and I swear to goodness, he's, he's talking in my ear. He's saying, no, don't do that. Do this, you know, back and forth, back and forth. And then he's saying, oh, look over there, look over there. And you look over there, not knowing why, and there'll be something incredible to see. I remember driving one time and I just, um, I was thinking, I will never get there. This is the longest drive in the entire world. And I heard him in my head, which sounds like I'm crazy, but I'm really not. I heard him in my head say, look to the left. And I looked over to the left and there were two rainbows, two beautiful rainbows overlooking this gorgeous scenery. 
And it was just all flat. And then the mountains are in the distance. And then there were two rainbows. And I thought, oh, thank you so much. It just kind of wakes you up, you know? You go, oh, that's pretty. And then you go on. I think that if we allow ourselves to be more and more aware of our surroundings, those surroundings, all those things that we see as different, kind of merge and become one. It's like, yeah, there's the mountains and the ocean, but the truth is it's just what is. It's, it's everything. You know, um, I often, I often just, you know, you, you can see divine grace in everything around you. One of my favorite things is I, I talk about them all the time. I have a nephew who's 14 and I have twin nieces who are nine. I was just with them last night. And when they get to giggling and laughing, I swear you hear angels around you. It's just the most beautiful thing, children teach us so much, so much. And, um, you know, I just think they're amazing. And they're, they're, they're like little sponges. They take everything in all around you. You know, I used to have uh, the big, I have a great big picture of garage in my bedroom. And years ago, their mom and dads, you know, when I would go away on a vacation, they'd come and take care of my dog and watch the house and such. And I would come home sometimes and I would, I would find Guru Raj's picture turned around to the wall or I'd, I'd come in, I'd call him, I'd say, where is his picture? He's in the closet. He kept staring at us. And I just would laugh. I'd say, what? They'd say, I, his eyes move, Aunt Patty. It's like, you know, he's watching us. And I'm like, oh, for God, what were you doing that you're worried about him watching you? You know, so he, but he would just be all around my house. I had a picture of him, a little small picture of him in my classroom. And I was teaching in a Catholic school and the kids would say, why do you have a picture of the Pope? And I'd say, no, it's not the Pope. <laughs> it's my teacher. And they'd go, your teacher. And then I'd explain. And I thought, oh boy, I'm going to be in big trouble talking about a guru and, you know, meditation and everything else. But I never got in trouble. I just, you know. People would come by and laugh. They'd say, oh, you know, that's the weird teacher. One time after I had my heart attack, no, I didn't have a heart attack. Take that back. I didn't have a heart attack. I had heart surgery. And when I came back to school, um, everybody was concerned about me. But I had gotten in the habit of absolutely meditating every day when I was, when I was at home. And I, I was sitting in my chair. It was a, a period where I didn't have a class. I was sitting in my chair. And I had meditated and, and I was, my head was like, you know, I had fallen forward and, and two girls came by and they saw me sitting in my chair and they ran down the hall to another teacher and said, we think Miss Spellman is dead. You know, we think she's dead. Will you check on her? So here comes Laura, my fellow teacher down the hall. She gingerly opens the door and says, uh, are you Okay. I said, yeah, I was meditating. What? She bust out laughing. She said, the girls thought you were dead and they wanted me to come down and check on you. <laughs> and she said, how deep were you? I said, I was pretty deep. I was pretty deep. And then she just laughed and we went on. But it's like, I try to incorporate it into my life any chance I get, you know. You ever been walking through the grocery store and suddenly your mantra is going on in your head? And it's like, I don't know. I just think every part of life is beautiful. And you just have, if you incorporate the divine into it in whatever form that is for you, it just gets richer and richer and richer. It's kind of like making um, icing for a cake, you know, and you want to make the icing pink. Well, you add a couple of drops and a couple more drops and a couple until you get the most brilliant color. It's kind of like that. The more of Guru Raj, the more of my spiritual practices I incorporate, the brighter and more wonderful the, the color of my life becomes. So I'm just incredibly grateful for what we have and what we'll have next. It's kind of exciting. What's going to happen next? You know, except getting older. That's, you know, I don't even mind that anymore. It's, that's okay too. So I don't know that I have anything else. I feel like I'm just blabbing. And, um, 
But is there something we can do? Can people ask questions or something or anything? Or should we just move on to the next thing? I don't know what happened to Sujay. He's, he's gone to another place. Sí, vamos. Vamos a abrir los micrófonos para poder hacer preguntas y participar los demás. Entonces ya cada, cada uno puede activar su micrófono si quiere realizar una pregunta. Ah, bueno, claro. Eh, one moment. Esta vez. You can activate your microphone and make some questions. Thank you, Pasha. That was very beautiful. Good job. You look gorgeous again. I love your jewelry. Oh, thanks. And, and people are sending you things on the chat. So you go to the bottom of your screen, you take your, your arrow down and it says chat. Yeah, I see it. Okay, cl it. Click, on, click on that and it appears on the side of your, of your it thing. Just, yeah. It just popped on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love the, uh, the icing metaphor. The, the uh, what? The icing metaphor, the pink icing metaphor. Oh, the pink. <laughs> it's, it's sort of like the uh, perfume factory. Only yes. You taste it. <laughs> yes. Uh, my nine-year-old nieces, I know a lot about pink icing. So little girls and pink icing. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Pasha, tell about the perfume factory, the garage. Tell that story. Oh, it's just, it's the story that uh, a lot, I think was in the original teaching manuals and such that it doesn't take long once you've walked in. If you walk into a perfume factory, it doesn't take long and you will come out with that all around you. So it's the same thing with meditation and our practices. The, the, we don't have to be in it for a long, long time before something of it stays with us. That's my memory of the story. Um, and so he would just say, you know, just stay with it, just stay with it. Um. I love seeing your faces. This is so much fun. It's so much fun to see you. <laughs> Hi, Beth. <laughs> One of the things I was thinking of when we started this was um, years and years ago, after Guraj had passed, we had an international course up in uh, Pennsylvania at a place called The Pines. And the lady who ran it, her name was Hildy. She was a German lady. And um, there was a whole group of uh, People from Spain were there, people from England were there. And that was the first course that I ever facilitated. Facilitated just means you clean up after people, you know, and you made sure things happen. And that was the first course that I facilitated. I think we had close to about a hundred people there. Do you remember Vidya? We had about a hundred people and we had a DJ and he was supposed to play till a certain time. And he ended up playing all night until the next morning. And then with no sleep at all, we all got in our cars and went home, you know, <laughs> it's like, but that's what I'm remembering is these lovely ladies from Spain that I got to, to see. And I don't know that I've ever seen anyone again um, since then. Mar was there a lady named Maria? Was there a Maria? I don't know. Anyway, I have a picture somewhere of these lovely ladies. Yeah, quite a few ladies. One of them is Uma that is right right here you were there no uma rosa you were in pennsylvania oh rosa i do remember yes yes that was a very loud course <laughs> i can tell a ramon story you want to know a ramon story i was i went with sutria to the airport in st louis to pick up Ramon because he had come in for something. I don't, I don't remember if it was a course or what it was. And on the way to Sutria's house, I lived in Missouri, Sutria lived in LA. So on the way from the airport to Sutria's house, we had to go, we, he had to go to the bathroom. Well, 
So we decided we would stop at my mother's house and let him use the bathroom. Now, my mom's house, you never knew what you were walking into. There were usually grandchildren crawling all over couches and who knows what he would have walked into, but we stopped. And we went inside and he went to the bathroom and my mother said, who is that man? <laughs> you know, I, I explained. At the time I had a dog and she was a chow, you know, the big furry ones that look like a lion, you know, she was a chow and she was the most wonderful kind dog, but she didn't like men. And I don't know why she must've been hurt as a puppy. So she used to hide behind the couch when a man would come in the house. So I knew she would do that and she wouldn't attack Ramon. I, I knew that. So, but as he was sitting on the couch and talking to my mother, and here comes the dog from behind the couch and she just peeks her head around the side of the couch and she walks over to him and puts her head on his knee. She, has, she never did that with any man at all. <laughs> and it was at that point I thought, I guess he's not such a scoundrel. He's probably pretty good if the dog likes him. <laughs> so that was my introduction to who Ramon was and is because my dog who didn't like men went over and was just like staring at him like, oh, you're wonderful. You know, the, that look dogs fit. Yeah. So that's, that's what I always remember when I'm with Ramon is that my dog liked him. <laughs> yeah, animals tend to like me. So tend yeah. to like me. <laughs> Might be I'm a little bit animal. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? I want to say thank you, too. I want to say thank you to Ramon, to all the people, Sergio, whoever. Is it Jeru? Is that how you say your name, Jeru? Anyway, I, and Emma, for th Hank, thank you. Thank you.